How's it going, Chris? Hopefully it's more than just you and me. Yeah, hopefully uh, it's going well. How are you doing, Nancy? I'm <laughs> doing good. Doing good. You guys I know Matt, been... Matt will be joining us, but he was from the road, so he said he'd be calling oh. in. Got good service, so. Um... You have to travel a lot like he does? um not as much lately like like well meetings like this we would ordinarily be traveling for so um not quite as much but we have several on-call planning jobs in the metro area or vicinity oh, okay. where we need to go for their regular meetings which are usually the first week of the month so do a bit of that too so good I gotta resend the chair planning commission the link. I'll be back. Okay. Hey Carl. Hey, Colin. Yes. Could you send Michelle the link to tonight's meeting? Because I'm in the meeting. I can't get to it. Could you forward that to her? I can't. I appreciate it. I'll let her know you're sending it. I There was something weird going on when I went to click join online meeting. It went to a Skype meeting. But there was in the... Um, oh, that's weird. Yeah. I, I found the same thing, Colin. Um, you have to click on, click on the long uh, URL rather than the join on line meeting. In the invite, which is interesting. Something went to muck. Hmm. I was actually wondering if we were thinking of going back to in person, I think we've talked about it a little bit. If I just make my voice go like this, it sounds like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I think that's a good one for uh, commissioner's choice. There you go. Or steering committee choice, I don't. Well, say, do we actually, um, steering, yeah. Do, do we do that at the end of these meetings too? I just remembered. Uh, we should probably wait so everyone can hear. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see how everyone feels. It's almost chilly day. I did send it over to her, so. Okay, thanks. Hey all, this is Matt. I'm uh, just on the phone today. Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, good deal. Um, I am uh, braving the wilds of I-80 uh, and some snowy weather up up north here. So 
Uh, but looking forward to listening into the conversation. That doesn't sound very good at all. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> like braving the cold of I-80, that is. <laughs> Not fun, so. <laughs> all right, good. Michelle got on, so that works. Yay. Yes, thank you, Colin. If it helps, we all had a, well, maybe not all of us. We, some of us had trouble also. There was a funky link in there. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I was just, I should check them maybe a more than a half hour before the meeting, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't. So thank you for bailing me out. And I looked all over the website too, and I couldn't see the Zoom link on the, on the city of Inglewood website either. It just had the agenda. So I'm like, well, that's good, but I still need more. So we don't have that on the agenda, the link, is that? No, it's because it's the steering committee, not an appointed commission. So uh, we don't do public comment. There you go. The steering committee. So if there's a link on them, then, but we upload the videos after so people can watch it. Yeah, if I couldn't get the link in time and get on, that's what I would have done, just watch it later. So. Well, we're glad you made it. Well, I am too. Thank you very much. I'll shut up now and look for the presentation. We waiting for a few more people who think, or should we go ahead and get started? And I don't know, if Brooke, is that you or is that Chris? Um, well, it would actually be, I think, Michelle. Um, no. I'm sorry. Actually, no, sorry, because it's not planning commission. So sure. it's going to be its staff or consultants. OK, OK. Um, yeah, it is. It is for after six. I guess if somebody joins afterwards, uh, they join afterwards, and that's that's fine. Um, but so yes, uh, I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, what we wanted to talk about uh, tonight was just uh, sort of what has been prepared since the last uh, public meeting we had in February, and um, show you that as well as talk a little bit about the upcoming. Uh, April 14th meeting and um, and just see any uh, thoughts from the steering committee and, and sort of move on from there. We do not have a planning zoning commission meeting tonight, so uh, we have as long as we want, but I don't think we had anticipated a, a long meeting, but um, certainly we'd uh, love to hear feedback from the steering committee. So uh, with that, um, Chris, do you want to lead off? And I know that uh, Matt Ashby's uh, here as well as his, um, he's, he's the phone number on, on our screen, so. All right, um, yes, I'll go ahead and lead off, Brooke, thanks. Um, I'm gonna be mission <clears throat> control while Matt's out braving the wilds of I-80. Um, so I'm going to share a quick presentation, just just as Brooke said, on on what we've been up to and giving you a flavor for what's going to be online, and then all in preparation for the April 14th, and then kind of turn it over to you all for discussion on the logistics of all of that. Um, I'm going to share my screen, and I may be jumping around a bit, so this one may tax my um, technological capabilities, but um, we do want to give you a flavor for uh, the material that's out there. So. I'm going to be probably jumping back and forth from our presentation. So if you don't see what I'm referring to, just yell and say, hey, you're, you're not on the right page. Um, is everyone getting the Code Next Steering Committee title page right now? Yes. OK. I am going to start the slideshow for the presentation, and then I'll be jumping out of this 
um, briefly to show you examples of the materials. But um, just a quick recap on where we're at. We you know, went through all your discussion sessions. Um, then we had a, an, an, at the beginning of this year, had a um, group discussion on how we wanted to proceed the broader engagement went to the city council with the joint meeting on the status update and then officially kind of kicked it off to the public on February 17th. And we're getting ready to upload all of the online engagement materials we talked about. And again, all of this is in preparation for getting people thinking and observing the community prior to the public workshop. Um, coming out of the workshop, I think one important thing to note is there will be ongoing additional engagement, whether it's um, following up on issues that we uncover or need to discuss further with certain constituencies based on what we talk about on April 14th, um, whether it's the housing attainability topic, which is going to be proceeding on a slightly separate track under that the DOLA grant that the city received. And so there's funding to um, have additional outreach on the, the, that particular issue that the committees discussed. And then we're also going to start engaging uh, the technical committee, which is mainly staff, but some of the things where we need to engage different expertise on the nuts and bolts of how we integrate this into the code. And then we will start preparing code drafts as early as April on things that we don't need deeper engagement and then, um, but hopefully tracking the rest of it and pulling it together by, by August. So we at least begin seeing the, the fruits of some of this, dis these discussions converted into code language. So that's the the big picture status on where we're at. Um, this is our overall engagement strategy that we we mapped out for the council at the joint meeting and then introduced to the public. And the idea is we want to progress from your um, discussions, which we were listening, uh, we as the consultant were listening those listening sessions to begin exploring options. Um, the period we're entering into now, and and then the last part of you know figuring out what this means for codes and all of the. The sub options below are, are part of the techniques that we're going to, to be using to get there. Uh, this was the, the schedule that again was presented on the, the 7th, February 7th and 17th with some a few modifications of things we've we finalized. One of those is that we did settle on um, trying to pursue all of this in one public workshop on April 14th. Um, so we decided that that was better rather than carving out into two separate nights of different issues and forcing people to go to two different things if they wanted to cover all issues. And rather than trying to repeat the same meeting twice, the idea was it, we're probably better off doing it once in one long meeting. Um, and, and that's another reason why some of these online preparation materials were very uh, important. Um, because as you'll see, as we discuss through this, um, there is also an option to not even attend that April meeting and get the same level of engagement if you choose. Obviously, we want people at that meeting um, so you can have conversations and, and hear different points of view and perspective. So we're really encouraging and promoting that April 14th meeting, um, but we also want to plan for the event that someone would have a conflict or someone wouldn't feel comfortable coming. And, and so we have options for that as well. Uh, this is a little more detail into what we've done since that um, first kickoff and um, the the joint meeting with the council. Um, we've begun to organize the online materials, and this is where I'm going to jump out of this presentation and show you some of these um, into these those three columns: um, issue identify issue introductions, and these are videos that that Matt has prepared that just give people a general flavor of the conversations we have had as a group and what the, the issues and problems we're finding with the code um, and sort of you just kind of touch on each of those issues briefly. And so there's those videos um, will be ready to be uploaded very shortly. From there, we produced issue papers. So those are things that people can read and consume at their own leisure. They have um, hyperlinks to other resources or case studies um, and examples of these projects. And, it, and it's more of something to, to read rather than look at, although there are, are supported by um, graphics and visuals, but it's more of a, a document to get people thinking and, and looking at things. And then the last part are what we're calling the deeper dives. And those are some of the, the videos where we, or the interactive PDFs and, and animated slides where we take typical context in Inglewood and begin to start to apply some of these different issues, opportunities, and options to those sites. And so each of the topics that you see there have a similar iteration of introductory video, supporting issue papers, 
and then the deeper dive. Obviously the housing ones got quite complex. So they have a little more, um, a little more meat and content to them. And I'll, I'll give you an example and a walkthrough of those in a minute. And again, all of that is by means of over the next three to four weeks, we want people preparing for that, that April 14th. So I, I guess nearly three weeks now as we're getting closer in on that. Um, but th that meeting is going to be mainly structured on a, a way to have public discussions on each of these topics and a way to begin collecting feedback and responses. And I'll go into some detail. We'll spend the last part of this meeting going into some, some details um, with that. So I'm gonna try to, hopefully my screen keeps sharing and I'll jump to the first example, which will be um, the introductory video on housing options. So bear with me for a moment here as I shift gears. Are you still getting my screen with the PowerPoint? And now do you see a file structure? Yes. Okay. Um, so here I'm gonna click on this video and this is um, Matt's introductory video to housing options. Again, all six of the topics or five for now, but eventually housing attainability that we've grouped under the steering committee will have a similar, um, similar tone and similar introductory video as this. So. It's supposed to be down, Chris. I'm I'm sorry. Did no audio. You know, no audio. The audio. Yeah. Okay. Let me try something else. Thank you. Sometimes you have to click the button to share audio when you're right. I thought I had done that prior, but let me escape out of this. You have to switch your audio to same as system. That's what I have to do on my laptop. Sounds complicated. Yes. I'm going to stop share for, well, oh, wait. Share sound. Let's see if that did it. Welcome to Inglewood Code yes. Next. Through this series of online materials, we invite you to familiarize yourself with some of the key topics we'll be exploring during our code update process. In this video, we'll highlight the third of three housing topics, options. Providing more housing options is one way to meet the needs of a diverse and growing community. Inglewood Forward, our comprehensive plan, encourages a regional balance of jobs to housing, promotes walkable neighborhoods, and encourages a greater mix of housing types. Our codes do provide some impediments to small-scale, multi-unit development types. However, accessory dwelling units are allowed in some circumstances. Additionally, guidance is limited for higher-density housing. The Code Next Steering Committee suggests that we be open to more building and lot types rather than focusing on density, while enabling relaxed standards to enable smaller scale housing types. For more information and to explore these options and more, click on the issue papers on the Inglewood Engaged site to explore these discussions in greater detail. Watch for deep dive interactive PDFs that dive even deeper into the topics to explore questions and options, including illustrations of how diverse housing types might be accommodated here in Inglewood. And bring your thoughts and ideas to our meeting on April 14th to join the conversation. Okay, so again, there's um, one, one of those for each of the topics. Um, I'm going to now shift to the issue paper, and I picked one of the more in-depth ones to, to give you a little more detail of that. So the housing options issue paper um, would also go up, and there's several of these papers that accompany all of the issues, too. So this is the kind of the second level in. Um, is everyone getting the, the screen with the issue paper? Okay, let me scroll back up to the top. And again, each of these are, are arranged under a similar theme that's going deeper than that introductory video. So the first is why it's important. So there's a statement 
talking about the, the, the city's comprehensive plans and policies, some deeper points on the, the housing objectives, and, and then some examples of housing options. You then get to page two of the issue paper, what's happening in Inglewood. Um, some of our analysis of the current regulations. So for example, for housing, we've begun to, to package your existing regulations into this typology of housing and showing where they where those types are allowed, and then begin to you know, just give people a context of what the existing regulations are. Some examples of what other communities are doing, some best practices, details on things to consider. And we're, so we're beginning to prep them for the options that we're gonna show them in the deeper dive. Um, and then because of the housing issue is, is arranged under all of the, the different districts, we begin to talk about, okay, what are different ways to incorporate them in different contexts? So you begin to see some of these housing types come up that each have an issue paper on their own that's hyperlinked, and we'll go into more detail for that. And I'll show you an example of those in a moment. And then it ends with, um, again, what, how would we implement this? What are some ranges of options that we need to consider? Um, coming to no conclusions, but beginning to prompt people for thinking a little bit deeper about housing options and beginning to start to think how, you know, how would we approach this from a regulatory standpoint? Trying to be very um, consumable to the layperson and give them an idea of the, the technical issues we're gonna wrestle with, um, but also trying to be as comprehensive as we can. Um, so if I'm interested in any one, particular one of these on the issue papers, I can go click on them and there will be a, um, again, for all of these typologies that we're thinking are part of your full suite of housing options, we have a, a little more in-depth issue paper. So I'll click on the small lot one for an example. So you will go to that paper and then it starts off with just a, um, an explanation of what's the typology? What are we talking about um, when we're dealing with these options? And it begins to show things more graphically, put some dimensions to them. From there, we go give, give some examples of uh, where some of these have been built, um, some uh, regional or local and others from out of the area, but those are all hyperlinked to either um, a project cut sheet that lets you get more information about that particular project or the Google Maps view where you can go right to that spot and begin exploring things on Google Maps. Um, and then we show different versions of where small format housing has been um, engaged and implemented. And then last on most of them, there are some examples, some from even your own area or your own community. So for example, the, the existing small lot, we, we begin to put some dimensions to where you're, you guys are experiencing small lots in your own community. And um, I can click here and hopefully you're seeing the same screen I am. Uh, so it takes me right to that spot of that particular house which we've documented and dimension. Then you can begin to go explore um, through the, the miracle of Google Maps and look at things that you might be concerned with. What's the context, what's around it, what's good or bad about that particular representative example. So again, all on the idea of um, expanding and exploring options. Uh, so the housing issue papers is the one that's the, the most um, robust, but essentially what we're looking at is a, a format that on each of the types, you'll see something like this, a three pager showing the layout of the, that particular typology in different circumstances showing some different applications from um, the region or perhaps nationally if we didn't have good examples from the region and perhaps even some from your own community. And then the, the overall, our overarching issue paper on housing um, and, and then each of the issues themselves is, is um, viewed in this format where it starts off with why is it important to our plans and policies? What do our current regulations say? what are other communities doing and some best practices? How do we need to begin to think about it in our own community and what are our options? So all six issues will be facilitated that way through um, the issue papers. Uh, the last part I wanna show is stuff you, you kind of, this is where we originally started with the, the interactive portion of it. So you've seen some of this already. Um, let me jump to the deeper dive interactive 
videos. And so again, the housing one gets a little bit complicated because we have a few places for them to, to jump out and, and take a different path, so to speak. Um, but this is what I'm opening is the one on um, overall housing issues. We start off with a, a page that tells them how to navigate these interactive PDFs. So you can navigate it by your keyboard, or you can also navigate it by the screen. We're down here, it's not quite as easy to see, but down here there's some um, silhouetted tools that can let you go back and forth, or you can use this option. So just a sort of a tutorial on how to use this tool. And I'm gonna just start advancing through this one. Housing options is this topic. Quick refresher on what our policies are, what our issues are, what we're trying to consider. And so then we start off on housing in the R1 districts and context. So we show Inglewood's example, it's a typical block scenario. These, this is what you find on a typical block. And here's what the current standards are. So beginning to tie people to the code and to actual sites in the community. And then we kind of put it, put it all in context. All the R1 districts are shown here. So when we're talking R1 and R1, A, B, and C, this is the map of the city. This is the, the region we're talking about. And then up in the corner is what a typical block in that district looks like. And then so from there, we have some, a couple of considerations for R1. And I'll come back to this slide because um, this builds, it gets cumulative. So the R1 is right now, it's predominantly single family. So it doesn't have as many options and considerations in the R1 districts. Although through discussion, we could be adding more. Um, then we move on to the R2 districts of which there's A and B. Here's a typical context typical lot sizes of what you find, a, a mix of single family and multi-unit buildings on typical lot sizes um, and what the standards, current standards say. And zoom back to the context of the community. So where are the R2 districts? Here they are mapped so they can navigate to, to the areas we're talking about here when we talk about R2 and then options. And you can see here, we start to build and each of these will be hyperlinked to a deeper dive one. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. And then the last one on the housing options is the MUR3, which is the one intended for the higher density um, districts and a range of options of, of which you have three different districts. But this is the one that's probably the most, um, I guess I, I would say underutilized because I think each of the districts has some, some problems with it of what it's trying to implement. So um, we'll probably have a quite a bit of discussion on this, but it's also a fairly limited area of your city when you when you look at the map. Um, so if we want these districts to be better used and better integrated, there's probably some improvements to need to be made. So we'll walk people through those scenarios. And then again, it, it would have the broadest range of types if we're shifting to this typology. Uh, let me back up a minute and show you where an example of each of these places where you can opt out to gain more information on any of these types. So I'll, I'll go to the small lot ones. I think this is the one we've shared with you before when we originally came up with this concept, but we've developed it a little further. Um, and I think by breaking each one out into different options, it makes it a little more consumable. It's not as daunting to cover everything. No one has to cover everything. They can only, they can explore as much or as little as they want. Um, but with it, with we get to the small lot housing, we begin to explain um, what we're talking about here. And then we begin to show the videos of um, different options to consider. So if we enable smaller lots, what could happen? Um, the current standards only allow them if they're already existing. So they're only a grandfathered situation. You can't create them anew. So we're suggesting create them anew. If you wanted, if at this point you wanted to find out what we're talking about, you could go back, jump back to the hyperlink to the issue paper. Um, but then we just begin showing some scenarios and let people view them and see whether they, they do or don't like them um, or what's good about the examples that we're showing um, or bad that we would need to regulate for if we were to consider this option. So the first option here is a, a small lot could allow you to split a lot, allowing small lots could allow you to split a single family lot in the middle of the block, uh, depending on whether you're in R1A, B or C and what the typical lot sizes are. The second strategy would be um, looking at some of the corner situations and what can happen there. And this begins to show some of the diversity. You could split one into two on a corner situation. Um, and maybe we would limit it to that in certain places. Or there's even a third variation where you begin to see um, alley adjacent lots come. And this is the one that's probably most prevalent existing in Inglewood. But again, they're only grandfathered right now. So you couldn't do this anew. 
but there's another example of a small lot application um, created an analogy adjacent lot. Um, and then each of these there also includes a, a hyperlink to go back to the options if you want so that they, you can navigate back to the beginning at any point in this um, interactive tool. And then the last one or some of the larger or second, the, the last couple are some of the larger projects where you could perhaps take a couple lots on the end of a block and reorient them to end grain. So you're getting anywhere from two to, to six dwelling units or four to six dwelling units, depending on how deep the corner lots are. But reorienting smaller lots to the end grain is a common strategy. Uh, and then the last thing the smaller lots can do uh, is this arrangement of putting them in a courtyard pattern. And again, some of the issue paper shows hyperlinked examples to actual projects that have done this, um, none specifically in Inglewood, but there's some from around the area that have done this as well. And so that's just one tool of the housing types, the smaller lot pattern, and it ends up with all of these options for potential applications. From there, and again, since this is the deeper dive, we wanna begin, these are the types of things that we're then going to be discussing on the 14th. So we don't want people to come to any conclusions with these. We're just trying to say, be, begin thinking about these. Where should smaller lots be encouraged, if at all? And so we give a range of options, reminding them of what the current standards are and, and beginning to think of what, what we might wanna do with this tool. Um, and then also, what are your most important concerns and considerations? These are kind of the caveats. I like this idea, but um, I like this idea only if, I like this idea provided we can address this issue. So those types of things are what we want to be thinking about as well. And that would end the small lot one. Now, each of the types will then go through a similar progression. We have most of all of the, if not all of those ready to go up. Um, so the, the schedule we're on for the, the top half of this, the, the online educational part that we want people interacting with now between now and and april 14th um is this here these are the examples but the the issue introductions are ready to upload um as early as tomorrow the issue papers will be most of them are ready or if they aren't ready they'll be ready by the end of this week so we can have all of that part of this presentation um up and ready and then the idea was with the deeper dives would kind of slowly roll out and we could be reminding people like, hey, there's new material. So each one of the, the five or six issues that we have the deeper dive on, we may be putting maybe one a day up or repopulating or putting a couple up at the end of next week and maybe a couple more at the beginning of the following week. But we wanna have most of the interactive tools up and ready. Um, at least two weeks in advance of that that April meeting so that people could begin, you know, just experimenting and, and thinking about these things and looking and, and, and hopefully exploring even more details on their own, because a lot of these, particularly the issue papers, we lead to, to resources that then also have their own hyperlinks and you can go even further um, down the rabbit hole, so to speak, if you if you want or if you're particularly curious and from the discussions we've had at the at the public meetings and with you all, I think a lot of people have already begun doing this and they're gonna uncover resources they're already familiar with. And, and that's probably a good thing because people begin to become really well-versed in these issues as well. Um, so the last thing I wanted to cover was in the, the bottom half of that approach that when we get to the 14th, um, our plan is this. Again, it's, a, it, it's, it, it's our discussion was it's better to have one long meeting that covers it all, we think we'll get the best engagement. And then to the extent that we uncover things that need further discussion or we don't come to um, a direction, or I don't wanna say uh, consensus because we probably won't, but if we don't get a sense for a really good direction, we'll, we'll begin having follow-ups and focus groups and further discussions that, that this committee will, will kind of help us direct. But overall, the, the idea is that the, the 14th would be structured around this type of agenda. Um, a project introduction, so people that are coming for the first time, you know, get the quick, um, quick version of why we're doing this and where we're at and what we've been doing. And then from there, we just go into each issue um, and spend about 25 to 30 minutes on each issue. The idea, would, our thinking is we plan for as few people, maybe a little more that we're at the um, 
public kickoff. Um, we hope at the very least we get them plus a few friends. So, uh, um, you know, a 30 person meeting, but ideally a 130 person meeting. So what we're thinking is as people come in, they're sitting at already established breakout tables. So we don't have a lot of time of moving to different stations. And we run the meeting from, from the front where we introduce each issue. Then we pause and each table has a breakout discussion on those issues. We, as the consultant team, would be um, roaming to help facilitate those discussions. Um, tables that are doing really well and having deeper discussions will be, um, we'll, we'll leave them be. Tables that need a little help, maybe we stop at and prompt them. Or to the extent some of you all who are very conversant in these topics as well can, can be at a table and stationed in doing that, we, we would like to explore that idea as well. But the idea is we spend 25 to 30 minutes on each issue. And then um, with since we have five, five big issues to cover, obviously we would take a break at some point in there. But after each one, we would kind of turn it back over to the head of the room to introduce the next issue. And we introduce it based on kind of the issue papers and interactive material, giving people just a, a flavor for it to the extent they didn't do any of the online engagement. But for the people that have already done the online engagement and have come ready to, to think and talk about it, they can dive right into discussing the pros and cons of each of the approaches. And we'll have materials at the tables to help you know, coordinate that as well. That's one of the things we'll be working on uh, as well. And then at the, at the end, what we would wanna do is report out from each table of what, what things were, viewed favorable, what things um, not so much, uh, what concerns they have and, and help give us a direction. Um, and then conclude with just a, a wrap up of the next steps. As I mentioned, you know, there are the, particularly on the housing attainability, there's gonna be a whole nother engagement um, strategy accompanying that. Um, and then on all of these issues, we would expect to uh, likely be um, either forming focus groups on issues that are particularly problematic, um, talking to the technical committee, obviously, on things that need um, more staff and, and, and professional expertise to help us solve, or, or any other thing that may come out of the 14th, um, those follow-up conversations we expect to be happening April through, through August. Um, but again, all of it's geared towards, we've got to keep in mind, the, the goal is to get to, to code language. Um, so sometimes code language won't solve every one of these issues, but we wanna make sure that we, the code is enabling the, the positive change the community wants to see. And so that's, that's what we will be listening for. Um, that's a quick overview of everything we're at. Again, we hope to begin rolling this stuff up as early as tomorrow, unless we hear any uh, grave concerns from you all on the direction we're going. And then the deeper dives we would expect to be coming in the next week or two. Um, so with that, I'll just turn it over to you all for any discussions, thoughts, or concerns. I'll, I'll jump in, Chris. That stuff looks awesome. I, I really am impressed with the amount of detail that's put in, but the ease of use, how you can jump back and forth with the hyperlinks. I mean, it. I was engaged in not even using it, and I think that's uh, it's a testament to the work that you guys are doing, so that's, that's great. I did have one question on the public meeting side, just to make sure I was understanding that process. So when we break out into these breakout tables, are you having some of your team at each one of those tables, or did you say you wanted us to lead some of those yeah. tables, or how is that going to work? <laughs> right. We, we, we haven't, we, in fact, we, as early as, as late as this afternoon, we were kind of talking about it amongst our team. Um, and it's all like we're, we're planning, we have to plan for a, a low attended meeting, but a very high attendance. So I could see us having ideally as many as 10 or 12 tables where we would probably need to roam to facilitate rather than have someone at each table. And I also think our, our preference would be hopefully the group discussion. We, we don't wanna set up a scenario where the discussion has to be led by one particular person. We would like the discussion to be more um, spontaneous and organic, but to the extent it's not, we will certainly be roaming to help prompt that. So that's where I meant we'll, we'll, we'll listen for, we'll have probably anywhere from, um, well, at least Matt, Graham, and I, and probably a couple more people from our staff there, um, city staff helping us go like, hey, table two's got questions, you know, so we can manage it that way. Um, to the extent we can begin to spread you all out as well, you can help be our eyes and ears or even prompt and lead a discussion as well. So I think that that's at the largest attended meeting. 
if it's not quite as well attended and we have, you know, maybe 50 people in five tables, then, you know, certainly stationing one person at each table will be very doable, but we want to plan for each opportunity and option. And we'll put further thought to that um, over the next week or so. Michelle, I see your hand. Yes, um, could you expand a little bit on how you're going to capture the uh, thoughts and uh, questions and things like that, both from the public online and in the meeting. In the meeting, are you going to have some sort of form or something? Yeah, help? that's great question. And thanks for the reminder. One of the things we're exploring is um, city staff and their communications department is working with a tool called Poll Everywhere. And so people can actually in real time answer some of the questions and give feedback. So depending on how we structure those questions, we may be taking um, the 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 thoughts for consideration that are in those deeper dives, um, we may be able to just, if, if those are the extent of what we want to ask and gauge um, feedback on, um, we would certainly just ask those and capture them and we could capture them in real time with this electronic tool. Um, so it, would be, it would be on, people could use it, tap into it on their phones or something or? Yes, that's exactly right. And, and we're trying to figure out, we, we, we don't want to overcomplicate the meeting, but right. we like the idea of, um, really automatically digitizing the responses. Um, and, and that's a really valuable thing. So if we can easily and smoothly do that, we will. Um, to the extent we can't, we'll have an alternative that's um, maybe paper-based or for people that aren't, you know, can't use the phone, we'll have a paper-based thing at the, at the table. Um, the other point of your question that I forgot to mention was whatever tool we're using for that meeting to capture that engagement, we also want to have it available for a period after the April 14th so that people that weren't there or that wanted to only engage online could also submit the same level of feedback, whatever that um, way of capturing the information is. Um, I think there's, there will also be an aspect of each table kind of reporting out that we need to think through as, as a team, but at least conceptually, um, we find that very helpful because it lets people you know, hear differences. We may find differences of opinion from one table versus the other. And so we want to hear that as well. Not that it's any per one person's opinion, but we'll figure out a way for each table to report out so people in the room can hear um, the differences of thought as well, because we think that's important. So pe so people, if they go through the, the process online at home or wherever, they can they can put feed their questions right into the, the, the platform that you, you'll have. have yes. Up. Okay. yes, exactly. Okay, great. Well, it, it would be very interesting to see, have, have that open for a period of time and see if there's waves of people, you know, okay, I'm okay with this. And then all of a sudden they're going, no, we don't want that. I mean, that would be interesting, but more importantly, we just need to capture the data. Thank Correct. you. Any other thoughts or questions or concerns, Carl? ideas on things we may have missed? Sorry, Carl, just put his hand up. Michelle, Michelle uh, had a good point there. Uh, how, how long will it be open afterwards? A couple yeah. weeks or three weeks a month? I think at least a couple weeks. Um, if it, and I would, <clears throat> my suggestion would be anywhere from two weeks to a month would be great. Um, if we're getting beyond um, a month out there, we're, we're going to probably be moving on and there will probably be some conclusion document that we produce for you all and the council to say, hey, here's the direction and, and ideas that seem to resonate the most that we'll be exploring. So I think when we hit that point, we'll, we would probably want to um, cut off the feedback, um, not only because we don't want any loose ends out there, but I also think there's a there's a risk of fatigue from the, pu the public to feel like they have to keep um, advocating or discussing what their opinion might be as well. So we want to keep it fairly concise, but I think a, a two to four week period is, is very reasonable from where we will be incorporating that input into our next steps. Yeah, I, I would think two weeks would be a minimum. And then uh, as it, uh, as the input drops off and after a week maybe there's no input so shut it shut it off 
So yeah. where will this be? Community room and the civic civic center? I yeah. believe that's correct. Is that okay? Yes, Carl. It's the same location as it was um, in February, and okay. um, I also I wanted to also mention that uh, for the last mm -hmm. uh, 12 days or so, uh, thank you and kudos to Bernie Costello. He made a, uh, with, with, with the help of our communications team, he uh, made a, a great video that is actually on the Inglewood Engaged Code Next site. And it gives even a broader overview of the project and encourages people to come on April 14th. So we're really trying to direct people to that meeting. Of course, they can join online, um, but we'd love to have people there. And, and we obviously encourage all of you as steering committee members to invite your friends and neighbors uh, to come to that meeting and uh, also direct them to the website so they can uh, be uh, educated on these things. And if they're not, that's fine too. They can just come to the meeting and they'll they'll hear uh, uh, some of it there as well. So, so thank you, Bernie. Uh, Brooke, what is the ad advertising for this? What how how are the people being uh, informed about the meeting? Well, similar to our February meeting, um, you know, there's there's a lot of that goes out online, boards and commissions, um, the council update. Uh, obviously, Inglewood engaged. We have our e-notifier, um, and then and then we would look towards doing some just some print items for our physical locations um, at uh, Mali Meridian um, and the Simon Center, Rec Center, those kind of places. So uh, we've got various venues that that can go out. We've got neighborhood liaisons. It's social media, our website. Um, that's what we're looking at doing. Will this be in the evening? Excuse me? Will it be done in the evening? Yes. Yes. Uh, I think we're shooting. Nancy, I don't know if you can. Uh, thank you. We're shooting for six o'clock again. Six to nine, I believe. Yes. Mm -hmm. as, as Chris mentioned, it is going to be three hours, uh, we are trying to not ask too much of people in terms of showing up two nights a row, in a row or two weeks in a row. So it's three hours, but we'll have a, a, a minor break in the middle. And um, uh, we're hoping for a, a really productive meeting. Obviously there's gonna be other opportunities to engage. Um, and, uh, and so we're, we're looking forward to it and, and all the material that, that will be out there. Michelle, you were next. Yes, um, just a thought. Um, would it, have we ever tried to contact the Inglewood School District and have our communications people put something together that can go out into the parent or school newsletter or something like that to advertise this, this event? Uh, not to my knowledge, that's that's a good idea, Michelle. Well, I just think that, you know, in general, parents pay attention to what the school sends home to the, you know, sends home with their kid. And uh, we might be able to very easily, um, you know, because they could put it in their electronic newsletter or something like that, just very easily contact a, you know, a, a very large population in, in an easy way, I hope. Judy? Want to comment? Thank you for all that work. Um, that those interfaces are amazing. I I think oh, yeah. that should meet everybody's needs. Um, I just had two. One, um, I brought this up before. I don't know if you've um, contacted the Chamber of Commerce um, to help them push out this as well to the business community. I think the businesses would certainly be willing to put something up in their businesses as well. Um, you know, the Swedish is uh, a member from Swedish Medical Center is on our board of directors. Um, I mean, I really think it's it's worth just having something go out from the chamber as a reminder as well to try and get 
the business community to help us get the word out because they'll they'll be more than happy to do that. I somebody at Swedish would love to see some things that support finding employment for their employees. Um, I can address yeah. that, Judy. It, yes, once we get this all, like Chris was saying, once we have this all up on the website this mm -hmm. week, and uh, I'll be contacting the director, David okay, Carroll. Right. Yeah. Um, so that that was all I had. Well, and, and not that it's relevant at this point in time. I don't know if I can be there on the 14th. I'm traveling that day. We have to go to a memorial in Georgia. So depending on how the airlines choose to let me come back or not on time, <laughs> I may or may not be able to attend, so. All right, anybody else? Questions for Chris or suggestions or any, any other thoughts on the public meeting or the information and how it's being presented. Michelle? Um, well, I just wanted to really tag on to what Judy was saying is that I'm looking forward to having this up on the on the website or someplace where I can take a look at all as little clips you've shown us before about the AD, ADU configurations and things like that. It's, it's really interesting. I don't normally think about things like that. And so, um, someone like me is going to really take a look at it and spend some time with it. And, and I, to, for you to be able to create something that in depth, I mean, it's basically a video game and kudos to you. I mean, that's just an extraordinary amount of work. Thanks. It wasn't just me. I got to admit, <laughs> <laughs> none of it was me actually. <laughs> any anybody else have any other comments? Sorry about that. Um, well, if if uh, nobody has anything else, Chris, do you have anything you'd like to add in closing or? Um, um, no, I think we're good. Um, just, you know, again, as you, as you all experience this with the general public too, let us know, you know, if, if there's glitches or things you think are missing, we want to, we want to keep this fresh and current. So we, you know, we can certainly adapt and, um, feed more content to the structure if, if needed. So just keep that in mind as well. Carl, I see your hand. Yeah, I, one thing I noticed on your presentation that that's that is uh, really impressive. It's pretty nice. And the uh, the small lots you combined small lots and made uh, multiple like a little circle of houses, basically. Mm -hmm. So in order to do that, you would have to purchase the multiple small lots, and. Uh, I don't know how you would do that. What what the code would uh, be to to do that? I, I suppose if you have if you own the loss and you're fine, but uh, if you only own one of the small lots, you can't do it. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so the the idea with the small lots was to show options for each of those scenarios. If you only had one, or if it was a larger lot, you're certainly going to have more options than if it's just a smaller lot. Um, if you had a couple lots, you're going to have even greater options, but it's that idea of the, the patterns kind of expanding. Um, and again, one of the, the key issues that, that Matt's intro video talks about is particularly on the housing side, a lot of this is to try and enable more smaller scale um, housing options that we think are kind of missing. Not that the larger scale projects won't still happen, but the thought is if we allow things that are smaller scale buildings, but actually much higher density projects, perhaps that's a relief to some of the pressures the com community is getting. So um, again, your point is exactly correct though, that some of these are gonna force someone to require, acquire um, two or maybe three lots to get them to fit in. Um, but we certainly don't want people acquiring a whole half a block to put a large building in, or, or we only do in certain locations, those MUR3 districts is where those types of projects are more appropriate. 
Uh, I, I can't really figure out how to do the uh, coding on that, but I'm sure that uh, this has been done before in other cities. So the, the, the process for the coding is, uh, is there. You just have to pull it out from wherever you have it, from another city or whatever. Yeah, and, and from a lot of it from those example projects too, that's a, a, an easy way to go. You know, you, we can measure those um, and, and begin to say, you know, this is a standard to, to consider. Okay, all right, thank, thank you. Okay, and as Chris mentioned, if, uh, as this comes up on, on the website, and you uh, and you take a look at it. If you see any glitches, please feel free to to reach out to us. Um, and actually, reach out. Just send an email to Nancy. Um, um, and that way, we'll just keep it. it will, we'll we'll get those comments uh, to Gould Evans and Chris and his team, and um, and then we'll make any tweaks we need to. But other than that. Uh, I'm sure we'll be reaching out with kind of a reminder update uh, prior to the 14th, certainly. Um, if we needed to have a meeting on the 5th for any reason, um, we would with the steering committee. But uh, for now, uh, I think time is well spent taking a look at the website and those particular issues, not only for yourselves, but uh, in order to interact on that evening. So, um, so yeah, if, is there any last thoughts from any steering committee members or staff or anybody? Okay, Nancy, Paul, is there any? Go ahead. Paula, Paula. I thought I'd do the official way instead of just blurting out uh, like I normally do. Uh, I, I was wondering if there was any thoughts or any discussion that we wanted to have briefly of having meetings in person or if we prefer to keep these UDC meetings um, here remote, especially if we've got a, you know, planning zoning either right before and after, maybe it's easier, maybe it's easier to do it in person. I'm not sure if anybody had any thoughts or I believe that's something we can discuss here just for this particular meeting. Well, I'll give just a couple of thoughts on that. Um, since this is somewhat of a joint meeting, well, not, not a joint meeting, but it's on the same evening, um, the steering committee and planning and zoning commission, um, I think uh, certainly if we would need to have both on the same page because you wouldn't want to require in-person and then have an option for not, you know what I mean? Um, and so, I think it's actually a bigger uh, discussion for the Plan and Zoning Commission, perhaps. If we want to defer to that, that's that's great. Um, um, if we want to discuss it in with this, I, I'm I'm great with that, Brooke. Thanks. And, and that's just my thought. If anybody else, at least from the steering committee, has any thoughts, I'll throw that out there. I think anecdotally, uh, people are, I, I, for better or worse. Certainly, some things have gone back to hybrid or in person. You know, we as staff are pretty much in person, you know, here at, at the city. Uh, but most of our uh, boards and commissions are virtual, and and some and and some of our business, uh, even with our, you know, developers, are are happening still online only. So, I think it's a good discussion. But I, I think it would be good to reach the or talk to the. Uh, uh, to the planning commission and kind of set that first. Nancy or Brad, uh, do you have any more information on what other folks or you know boards and commissions or where things are headed, you know, with council and, and what have you? Good evening, everybody. It's Brad. Um, I don't have a specific update on that, Brooke, but I would just offer that for the subcommittee meetings, it would be logical to have. Um, the ability for Chris to continue, Chris and the and the and the project team st uh, staff to continue to join us uh, remotely because obviously our expectations going into this project that they wouldn't be here physically for every subcommittee meeting. So just um, food for thought on that on that front. 
And it's great to see everybody this evening. Sorry I was late. I was at the budget uh, advisory committee meeting earlier this evening. So good to see everybody. You, you did bring up a really good point, Brad. I, obviously, uh, having Chris here is essential. <laughs> Maybe not essential, but it's a really big benefit. And even Matt driving along, I think some of those benefits um, we tend to forget about when just saying, let's go back. I like to be around people. I think there's a different level of interaction, but um, obviously having the ability to get there and the flexibility is important to consider. Okay. Um, anybody else have any comments before we close tonight? Nancy, do you have anything? Oh, Michelle, I see. Well, I just was gonna um, just offer my two cents on the virtual or hybrid or one or the other. Um, since this is a steering committee and has people on it that is not that are not on planning and zoning to ask them to come down to city hall um, for you know our these meetings have been lasting about an hour or something like that um, might be a little, little bit tough when, in a busy time of the day um, so just my two cents on that that maybe we want to at least while this committee's still working uh, just keep it um, zoom so just my thoughts Okay. Any final thoughts? Judy? Um, you know, certainly I'd like to see, and this is a planning and zoning discussion, I would certainly like to see public hearings back in person for those nights where we only have planning and zoning commission no, work. No, and No planning, we can't discuss planning and zoning. I, no, I know, but I'm just <laughs> saying, I think if this can stay for, I don't think it has to be an all or nothing. I think that if we have nights where it's not that there's no steering committee meeting that planning and zoning can make a separate decision is what I'm saying. So I just, yeah. I think there's options for both. All right. Well, thank you all for uh, attending tonight and giving your feedback. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, if, if, if nobody has anything else, uh, we can close the meeting. Nancy, any, anything you want to say, or are we all set? I think we'll go. If we are good to go. I will reach out and let everyone know when all the materials and the videos are uploaded, uh, later this week and send you a reminder for the April 14th meeting. Great. Thank you all for coming. And Thank you. We'll be in touch. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Good to see everyone. Thanks, Chris and Matt.